This is AutoLine Daily, the show dedicated to enthusiasts of the global automotive industry. Tesla reported its second quarter earnings last night, and here are the highlights from that and Elon Musk's call with financial analysts. Tesla delivered over 466,000 EVs to customers, up 83% compared to a year ago and an all-time record. It was also up 10% from the first quarter. Revenue came in just below $25 billion, or $24,927,000,000 to be exact. That was up 47% from a year ago and also an all-time record. It posted an operating profit just below $2.4 billion, but that was actually down 3% from a year ago. And it posted a net profit of $2.7 billion, which was up 20%. It also generated a billion dollars in free cash flow, which was up 62% from last year. Everyone was wondering how price cuts would affect Tesla's profit margins, and it did take a bit of a hit. Its gross profit margin fell to 18.1% versus 22.4% a year ago, and its net profit margin was 10.8% versus 13.3%. Share prices fell a couple of bucks on the news, but it's still up 6% for the week so the stock market doesn't seem very concerned about the drop in margins and is focusing on top-line growth and free cash flow instead. On the earnings call, Musk also dropped this little news nugget. Well, maybe it's not so little. He said a major OEM is in talks with Tesla to license its full self-driving technology. And that would be a major coup for Tesla if a legacy automaker signed up for FSD. Elon wasn't saying who it is, so allow me to speculate for a moment. Ford was the first automaker to sign up for Tesla's NACS, or North American Charging Standard. Elon and Ford CEO Jim Farley obviously have a lot of respect for each other, and Ford also sold off its investment with Argo AI, which was developing autonomous technology. So we think Ford could be at the top of likely suspects who are talking to Tesla about using FSD. And one more nugget from Tesla. In its quarterly reports, it likes to post pictures that sometimes give us really good insight into its new product or manufacturing processes, like this shot of a Cybertruck on a body framing line at its assembly plant in Austin, Texas. It clearly shows that the truck is made with two gigantic one-piece giga castings for the front and rear structure and they're connected by a stamped center structure that's either aluminum or high-strength steel. It also reveals how the battery pack, the roof, and the body panels will complete the structure of the vehicle. Musk made a big point that the Cybertruck will be the only pickup truck that will have a six-foot bed, but an overall length under 19 feet, meaning it will fit in most garages. Stellantis is aiming to come out with a new type of battery technology before the end of the decade that it says will make its EVs more reliable, last longer, and have better efficiency. Most electric vehicles take in AC power from a charger, which is converted to DC before being sent to the battery. Then DC power from the battery goes into an inverter, which switches it back to AC so it can then go to the electric motor. But the new jointly developed Intelligent Battery Integrated System, or IBIS, has shrunk the charger and inverter functions down so small that they can be integrated directly onto each battery module. This gets rid of clunky charger and inverter units, which will clear up space while also reducing the amount of wiring. It's taken four years to get to this point of development, along with a demonstrator that's been operational since last summer. It says it's now focused on building a fully functional prototype vehicle and plans to make the technology available on vehicles before 2030. Toyota isn't the only Japanese automaker developing solid state batteries. Nissan is too, and it's gearing up to begin pilot production next year at its oldest plant in Japan, 
which currently makes internal combustion engines. The plant in Yokohama opened in 1935 and just celebrated its 40 millionth engine. If the pilot goes well, Nissan plans to begin mass producing solid state batteries in 2028. And by that time, the company's goal is to develop solid state batteries that hold twice the energy of lithium ion batteries, charge in one third the time and cost $75 per kilowatt hour and it believes it can eventually bring that down to $65 per kilowatt hour. But even though Nissan will build batteries at its Yokohama plant, the company says engine production will continue at the same level for, quote, some time. Magna is going to make a significant investment to support Ford's gigantic manufacturing complex in Tennessee, which is where it's going to make its next generation of electric pickups. Magna will invest $790 million to build three plants in Tennessee, and two of those facilities will be located at Ford's Blue Oval Complex. Magna will produce battery enclosures, vehicle frames, and seats at the plants starting in 2025. There's been a lot of hype around sodium ion batteries because they're easier to make, and sodium can be found just about anywhere, so it's cheap. But recent tests done by the China Electronic Standardization Institute show that it will be at least two to three years before sodium becomes competitive with lithium iron phosphate batteries in larger EVs. And that's because they're less energy dense and charge slower. So in the meantime, sodium battery makers are targeting small to low end EVs and two wheelers, and they're looking at using them to replace lead acid batteries. If you hadn't noticed, there's a growing trend in the auto industry around sustainability. And one of the things that many automakers are zeroing in on is going leather free. And while brands like Kia already have sustainable materials in some of its vehicles, it's stepping that up with new models like the 2024 EV9. It will feature 10 sustainable applications, including plant and bio-based components, as well as phasing out leather. Kia says the EV9 will become its baseline for all of its future new models. If cooler heads didn't prevail, one of these could have been the Porsche Crest. Its cars originally only had the word Porsche spelled out on them, but in 1952, the Crest we now know today was designed. However, it wasn't an instant success. Sales managers and dealers wrote to Porsche saying they didn't like it, instead citing Mercedes and VW as having good logos. So when artists came up with these designs in the early 1960s as an alternative, and one was supposed to be used on the successor to the Porsche 356. However, it never happened. But could you imagine what would have been? And don't forget to check out AutoLine After Hours at 3 p.m. Eastern Time today. But that brings us to the end of today's show, and thank you for tuning in. Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone, solutions for your journey. Intrepid Control Systems, over-the-air engineering, boost your game. And by Scheffler, we pioneer motion. At Scheffler, we pioneer motion. Electrifying mobility, manufacturing smarter, reducing CO2 emissions, making energy production clean. Scheffler pioneers motion to advance how the world moves. We want to know what drives your testing. OTA, connected car, diagnostics, remote testing. Intrepid Control Systems is here to help you work from anywhere. Intrepid Control Systems, driven by your data.